but it's, 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 it's what the Spirit of the Lord is resting on us right now. And that is obedience. We take that scripture so literal, uh, or we don't necessarily take it literal enough. We just, you know, after a while, son, you know, everything becomes cliche-ish in church. The word of God becomes cliche -ish. You know, we don't longer know the power of the word. And so when we say obedience is better than sacrifice, we just say it, but we don't really walk in that. We just quote something because, you know, it sounds good and it'll make me sound like I'm spiritual. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But we don't really walk that through because we'll throw something up on the altar sacrificially and then turn around and walk in disobedience. So we don't believe that. You know what I mean? So that spirit of obedience, that, that message of obedience is resting on the house. And how many know that when God gives a word that there is purpose for that word how many know he always prepares us and preps us for uh what is to come and gives us the necessary tools for that uh that thing that's coming and so we know uh just recently just 2002 we've been talking about clear vision right and the year of clear vision and what we are asking God to do is give us, I even said, I said, Lord, give me insight. Let it be so clear I cannot look away. That no matter what direction I turn to, I must see it clearly say that. And so that is the kind of vision I'm asking God for. Because sometimes we turn our eyes and look away because we don't really want to see that. We don't really want to, you know, understand that. Or we don't really want clarity in that, you know, in that particular thing. And so we'll turn away and get another vision. Come up with another insight for it. But I said, God, whatever direction I turn, north, south, east, west, I want it to be so clear that I can't, no matter where I turn, it is the same vision that you're showing me. And so this word obedience is just ringing in me. And how many know there's power in obedience? I want to know, somebody got some money? Cash money, just real quick, get some cash money. So all the cash carriers are digging. Murder got that. See, see that I'm talking about that's that right now money. See, some of y'all got to go by the ATM, got to go on your phone, transfer money, got to do all that other stuff, cash at me something. I told Mistress yesterday, can you cash app something for me? <laughs> Still ain't brought her money. I'm going to get it, though. <laughs> I'm going to give this back to you, Myrtle, because I'll be done loan this out. Uh, <laughs> Myrtle brought me some cash money. Who got their boomerang? Anybody got that boomerang? Come here, Mary. Give me your boomerang. I'm going to borrow it. She's got a very festive-looking boomerang. It's matching her out. Look at this. Just matching. Look at that. You don't even get no better than that. Look at that. God bless her. Who got their seed? Come here, Brother Heron. This is my brother for, for real, for real. Me and Brother Heron, we be running that truck sometime. That little side corner over there. <laughs> he got it. Here, mama. That's what he called me. Here, mama. <laughs> he got his seed. I'm not going to take it for long. I'm just going to borrow it. Go ahead, find it. Let's get past all that money. There you go. <laughs> I've got that big money. You just got that, you know, it's, it's leaning on it. So we have some cash money here. All of us have need of. We all have our boomerangs that we are believing God, what the man of God said. And then we have our seed, everyone with their seeds tucked away nice and Two years from now, if I ask you for that seed, most of y'all going to have it because you tucked it somewhere so you wouldn't leave it or forget it, right? So it don't get wet or dirty because it might grow. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, all of these things have no power. None of these things have power. If I was to take this seed and throw it away and, and it hit the dirt, it's just going to grow a watermelon. This is what it's going to do. This right here will dilapidate and probably deteriorate and turn back into what it was, which was, you know, wood, you know, paper, and just, and the same thing for this right here. There's no power in this. 
The power comes in these items in the obedience. The man of God spoke to us and told us to keep the seed with us for 90 days. This is the word that he gave. Keep the seed for 90 days. The Lord is going to do something. The power is in the word. It comes with the, uh, with the movement of obedience. Same thing with the uh, boomerang. And this right here, if USA was declared worthless, it'd be worth nothing. Obedience. We're obedient to the fact that they say this is worth something. Right? This, if, if, if U.S. Congress was to declare this to be garbage, we would say it's garbage. No power. Right? This is what the word of God is to us. This is what obedience is to the believer. Without obedience, there is nothing else. We falter and we'll fail in everything. Say everything. There is no part of God that disobedience is tolerable. Now, he is a God of mercy and grace. And he is a good father in cultivating us. But how many know God still wants our obedience? And in order for us to understand the power of God, we have to walk in it. So I'm going to give back everybody's thing because after church, you know, my life get a little hectic. So the boomerang, I would toss it, but it's probably not going to work. Thank you. And then the seed and the $10 bill. Myrtle, thank you. Brother, a brother there. Thank you so much. Let's get into our scripture, Second King. While we're talking about the power of obedience, that it will prevent failure, I want to also enlighten you. Uh, I'm going to do a twofold kind of teaching today about pride. And with pride, there will be failure every time. Say, tell your neighbor, with pride, pride. there'll be failure every time. Every time. Not sometime, part of time, depending on how you work it. Pride is failure so we have to walk in obedience and we can never walk in our pride because pride will keep us from walking in obedience will it not oh, this is good stuff I'm telling me and God just talked all day about it second Kings let's go second Kings 5 and of course you know I'm in the NLT first verse and this passage of scripture is one that I love to teach out of I could teach this passage of scripture for probably a month and not teach the same thing. It is a very familiar to us all. Um, is speaking in reference to Naaman, the general, mighty warrior, was loved and admired by King Aram. And just so that you have the, the background, Naaman had leprosy. And uh, the king loved him. The king loved him because, you know, he had won very, very many uh, uh, victories for him. You know, you got a general in your army and he's just pushing forward and he's winning things for your, you know, for your kingdom. You know, he becomes very valuable to you. He becomes an asset to you. And more than likely, relationship is built. And so he's probably got a love. He, he admires this man. And so he has a love for him. And so he's, he has a concern for his well-being. Well, here in this passage of Scripture, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit because, you know, it's a lot of Scripture. I'm going to keep Reverend Powell on his good foot. But here, uh, Naaman being stricken with leprosy, the king is saddened by that. And so then in one of the uh, uh, times where they had gone out and invaded some territory, they had obtained some, some slaves, some persons that they are using in their own little kingdom. And Naaman had a little handmaiden that he had brought from his, for his wife to serve her, right? I'm preaching now. Y'all get ready. I'm preaching. Don't look, look up. I'm already preaching. 
And so this little handmaiden was from Israel. She had knowledge and she had understanding about her land and the people that were there. And so she had uh, serving her masters uh, and, her, and her mistress, she served them, I guess, well. And so in one particular uh, passage of scripture in here, she tells uh, her mistress that her master, Naaman, ought to go see this prophet that she knows for healing because he has what? Leprosy. And so what happens here, I'm going to read this passage of scripture because there's something that I want you to grab. So I got you up to speed. So here in verse 4 it says, and this is 5 and 4. So Naamath had told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. And the first thing the king said is, we'll go and visit the prophet. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naamath started out and, and he had uh, gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Now, that right there clarifies that we was a brother, okay? <laughs> that, valuable. You know, he had silver, gold, and 10 outfits. <laughs> Y'all didn't know. That's how you know it was a brother. Valuables. Verse 6 says, the letter up to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. The first part of this was um, Naaman, a great man. He had authority. He had power. He was the king's right-hand man when it came down to doing things. You know, when, when, when a king has a general that has won many victories, this person becomes someone they heavily rely on. He becomes, there's a confidence and a trust that he has in this man because this man controls the army. The very army that defeats other armies is now his army and his leader. And so there's a trust and a confidence there. And so when King heard about this possibility of him being healed by this prophet. He told him first off rip, go. He said here in that scripture, I wanted to read exactly how he said it. Verse four, go and visit the prophet. So when he in verse seven, let's go down here. So when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I God? that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? Naaman was given a letter. I'm gonna talk about this is, we're talking about disobedience and we're talking about pride. The first thing that I want you to get in this whole piece is that Naaman was sick. The king wanted him healed. The king says, uh, I will write a letter and send gifts for your healing to the king of Israel for your healing. But let's go back to what was said in the beginning. Who did the little girl say would do the healing? She told him to go see who? I wish he'd go see the prophet. But who did the king write the letter to? He wrote it to the other king. And not only did he write it to the other king, but he wrote it to the king with a demand on it. He says, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in this man and said, am I God that I, that I can give life and take it? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's trying to pick a fight with me. And that's basically what has happened here. There's two problems in this whole passage that I've just read when it comes down to obedience and when it comes down to pride. The first thing here is the king of Israel is toiling over a task that was never meant for him. Sometimes we get into a thing, we're toiling over something that it's not even our task. It's not even our job. We're not even sanctioned for this. But sometimes we'll take on something because our pride won't let us tell it, it ain't me. I'm not the one. I'm not the one you ought to be seeing about this. 
But I'll, I'm the king, so I'm the king. You know, I'm supposed to be able to do everything. No, sometimes you're not. Sometimes even in the position that you're in of authority, you're still not the one. But if our pride get in the way, we won't walk in obedience. Because to me, truly, if someone comes to me and they want something done like a PowerPoint, I'm going to tell you now, don't do it. I'm in a position of authority here at World Changes Tabernacle. And if someone asks me, like Micah came up to say, Grandma, I need you to help me with my PowerPoint. Let me tell you something. See your mama. I could have been very prideful and said, you know, I'm his grandmama. I know a lot of stuff. Let me, let me just sit down and figure this out. But the position of pride will put you in the position of disobedience. The king here was in the position of pride. Why not? You the king. You got to know the prophet is in the land. As the king of a kingdom, would you not know that there's a prophet in the land? Why didn't he refer him to the prophet? Because he what? I'm the king. So instead of him using his knowledge and understanding of who is around him to get the job done, he's going to take it upon himself and tour with it. Now he's walking in this thing of torment and sadness and feeling all crunchy now because he can't heal. And then now he's going to pick up something else. He's just trying to pick a fight with me. See, now we just done turn that whole thing around. It's not even in the position that it was supposed to be in. Because now we're trying to find something to grab at when in actuality you're walking in your pride as the king and you should have called upon the, called upon the prophet. But let me tell you something. God is a God of order. And just to teach and show a principle or, or, or to give a lesson, he'll let some things roll in that direction just to come back and show you the way. And see here in this passage of scripture, it shows it there. Uh, go down to verse 8. Because <laughs> I had to laugh at that. It says, but when Elijah, the man of God, heard. I'm going to tell you all something about the herd. Sometimes the prophet here. Sometimes the prophet will hear, and he will respond to what he hears. And so we can't be crunchy about what the prophet, what? Hear. Verse 8 says here that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, and he sent this message to him. Why are you upset? You're toiling about the letter that you got from the king. To heal his favorite servant. You're tearing and ripping up clean good clothes. About something that you have no power or authority of. But you know the power and the authority. And you haven't called on it yet. Right. You're walking in disobedience. First you walked in pride. Because you're the king. You think that it has to be at your hand. That it live or die. If you know that the doctor is in the house. And something happens, why are you over there working on them? Why not call and say, Dr. So-and-so, we got a situation here. Can you come? But is that not how we do? We walk in our pride, so we want folk to think it's us. We, we, you know, is, is that me? It happened through me? Come on, men. Head of the household. Won't give God the glory for nothing. It's me. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have it. What? What? That's a little sad. A little shade. That's not happening at our house. Don't worry about it. We give God the glory. But my thought was just that we, we don't use what God has put in the earth. The man of God is sitting amongst them. Like the man of God said amongst us, we won't utilize him. He, he a man like me. He not. He's the prophet. I know you grew up with him. Ain't that right, Winnie? You grew up with him. Y'all ate dinner together. Laughed and fought together. 
ran down the street together, played with the same little friends together. Did y'all not? She much older than you. You whooped his behind. It didn't change the fact he's the prophet. Is that right? When he comes around and, and, and his family uh, get together, it doesn't change his position. If something was, someone was to say, well, we need a man of God, we ought not to be looking around like, cause, just because a little prey in the house, we shouldn't be looking around like, what are we going to do? What are we gonna? There's a prophet in the house. <laughs> Let's go to him. Let's see what God is going to do. But sometimes we overlook what's among us because of pride and or disobedience. We won't walk in it. Here in this passage of scripture, let's go down a little further. <laughs> Elijah asked him, why are you upset? Send Naaman to me. And he will learn that there's a true prophet in Israel. See, this is the thing about Elijah. He wasn't cocky. And he wasn't puffed up. He knew who he was. He knew who God called him to be. And sometimes people look at you like that when you're sure of who your call is or what your call is. They look at you as, as if you're cocky. And it's not that. It's just that I know what God has given me. Like I know my assignment on my life. I know my assignment. I'm assured of my assignment. And so it, sometimes it's, it can be a little maybe intimidating to some people. And a little, sometimes a little may seem a little cocky. You think, Dana? No, not so much. But at the end of the day, my assurance or your unassuredness about my assurance is this. <laughs> Null and void. Thank you, baby girl. Preach it for me. At the end of the day, we have to know who we are in Christ. And Elijah here knew exactly who he is. So he says, why are you sweating it? You know I'm a prophet. Send them to me. You up there ripping up your clothes that we don't pay good taxes for? <laughs> sweating over something that is not necessarily anything you should be sweating over? Send them to me. Let me show him that there is a true prophet in Israel. And so Naamath went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah. Isn't that how we come when we in need? Come big and grander. Instead of coming lowly. He come with his horses and his chariots. How many horses and chariots does it take for you to be healed? We, that's that pride thing. That's the thing that will keep us from walking in obedience. He's already dragging his feet anyway. about Because the little girl told him that he ought to go. So he's already dragging his feet in the pride and in the, in the, uh, the uh, actual uh, obedience. Then you get there and you bring your whole entourage because you somebody. See, I'm telling you about pride. Pride will keep you from walking in obedience. Here he says, uh, uh, but Elijah sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. You mean big old Naaman with his entourage out here. You're not going to come out and talk to me? like the important person that I am? You're just going to send this message? The man of God sent a message to Tyshawn to go and tell Brother Don here something. You're not going to receive it because Tyshawn is sending the message from the prophet? How many times have we missed it there? How many times have our pride, you know, if we're a leader in the, in, in the church or we're a leader in the community, if the man of God sent a word through somebody, you can't receive it because it didn't come directly from him. We feel like, well, I'm a, I'm a minister. How come he didn't call me directly? Uh, I'm an elder. Uh, I've been with him for... 10, 15 years, you mean he got to send a message? He can't come see me for himself and speak a word to me? Are y'all hearing it? You're hearing the pride that we don't took a position, that we are in some kind of position, that we are authorized a one-on-one -on -one personal visit from the man of God in order to receive a word from the Lord, in order to have our situation touched by God? 
Pride will keep us from walking in obedience. And then the obedience will ha have us to fail yeah. and falter. Here, there's no power in the Jordan River. I get it. Just like there's no power in that boomerang and no power in that seed. The power starts here of going to dip yourself in the Jordan River with the obedience. This is the thing that we got to gravitate to today. I, this, if we don't get anything else, we don't be here long, honey. We got to gravitate to this one thought. Come up first out of our pride, our mind thinking of how we want to see God do it. Pride will have you feel like, well, I'm just too good for this particular thing. How God is doing it. I don't want to have to go through the lowly in order to get to the mountaintop. But that might be the road God is taking you through the lowly to get you to the mountaintop. But we feel like sometimes we have arrived someplace. And so therefore we can't be in this position. How dare God put me here? Out of obedience how dare God put me in this position how dare God send me to the south side with my ministry there is no power in the Jordan River Naaman told him to go dip himself in the most nastiest water that he could have found this is the most nastiest water it's, 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 think about our Chattahoochee River Worse than that. Go dip yourself seven times, not once. You mean I got to get down in nasty water seven times? See, I got to get down in that nasty water seven times. See, if I see something floating in my bath water, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. This is, and all this is for me, so I'm done. I'm scornful. I'm scornful by my own mess. I'm just <laughs> somebody else's animals. And see, I, I, I can't be in Africa. I can't. Can't. Lord, don't send me, please. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some things I'm just saying, you know, it's hard to do. And so when we get to that place where we're scornful, you know, we think we, you know, some people, you can't ask to sit on the back row at church. Okay, y'all laugh if you want to. <laughs> you messing around to get it started up here. <laughs> Don't ask him. Don't ask him not to sit on the front row because we think we're in a position of authority. We think that there's something better about us here than it would be us back there.